Building on the cliffhanger over the last section, what if randomization is not possible? Unfortunately, at least for scientific purposes, it's good for many other reasons, but for scientific purposes, you cannot always perform a randomized trial. Would it be ethical or even possible to randomly assign subjects to either smoke or not for a study where we wanted to look at the relationship between smoking and some comorbidity? No, it wouldn't be. Well, what do you do in this situation? Well, from a historical, some large public health findings have been made through studies that were not technically randomized studies, but were almost as good as randomized studies, scientifically speaking. And we'll just look at these. They happen very rarely, but they have contributed to some big public health interventions. So we should look at these for their history and also for their, that are nice properties. And these are called natural experiments. And they're functionally almost as good as a randomized trial in terms of the scientific validity of the results, etc. And this is what happens where individuals are assigned to groups because of completely fortuitous reasons, which is a fancy way of saying almost random reasons. They don't necessarily self-select, but they're not assigned by the flip of a coin. The assignment may, may not have been based on a traditional randomization schema, but it's functionally more or less as if we had done that. Of course, this doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's good for researchers. And like I said, there's been some classic results discovered because of studies of this nature. One of the key examples, you may have covered this in your History of Public Health course, is cholera and water the classic public health study by John Snow. In 1852, in London, England, a law was passed which required only unpolluted parts of the Thames River to be used for drinking water. And there were multiple water companies in London at the time, including Lambert and another one called Southert and Vauxhill. So two companies that we're going to focus in on. When the law came aboard in 1852, only Lambert complied with the law. Southwark and Vauxhall, as well as other companies, supplied customers with water, still from heavily polluted portions of the Thames. So what they did was they actually looked at the mortality rates by cholera per 100,000 persons by water company, pre- and post-water law. So the mortality rates were similar qualitatively and statistically between the two companies, the mortality rates by cholera, in the pre-water law period. At that point, everybody was taking from everywhere in the Thames, regardless of its condition. In the post-water law, Lambert complied and only took from unpolluted portions, whereas the other company continued to take from all over the river. And what we saw was a sizable reduction in the death rate by cholera for those who got their water from Lambert, but no qualitative change, a slight increase actually, and certainly not a statistical change, although you don't see that result here, in the other company. And John Snow and colleagues used this to demonstrate the association between dirty water and cholera and led to the clean water movement functionally. So this was a huge result. So was the treatment assignment random? Well, people didn't choose their water companies by the flip of a coin. But what they found was that the groups that were compared were similar on characteristics that could be measured easily, at least, except for the intervention. There was no apparent systematic differences in economic status, disease status, etc., health status of persons between the two water companies. Because both water companies competed for the same customers throughout the city of London. So no, there was no coin flipping involved here. The study was not designed randomly, but the mechanism by which people chose their water companies functionally acted as a random assignment. Another classic example where we learned a lot about HIV and its transmission by bloodborne agents was, was the study on HIV and hemophiliacs. Another one done in the United Kingdom, and it was uh, replicated elsewhere. But the mortality rates per 1,000 person years among HIV-infected and uninfected hemophiliacs was looked at in the pre-HIV period of 1977 to 1984 and the post from 1984 to 1992. And what they showed is that those were uninfected. There was no discernible change or difference in the mortality rates among hemophiliacs in that pre-HIV and post-HIV period. But for those who were infected 
vis-a-vis -vis transfusions, the mortality rate was roughly sixfold higher after the introduction of HIV into the blood supply. And so this study documented the effects of HIV on mortality of individuals ostensibly among persons who had similar characteristics otherwise, except that some of them were unlucky to get transfusion that was infected with the disease. They did not find any other significant characteristic differences between the infected and uninfected hemophiliacs. And this is one of the first studies that showed the mortality risks associated with having HIV. But natural experiments are few and far between. Although they've led to some amazing, useful discoveries, we can't count on those happening. And of course, there's many times where we can't count on randomization either, or we can't do it. So there's another design that's used many times called observational studies. This is another example of a prospective cohort study in which the exposures of interest precede the outcome, but subjects are not randomized to the exposure groups. They are Sometimes we call it self-selected to be an exposure group. Sometimes this is the only type of study that can be done. If we're looking at the association between an outcome and smoking, as we said in the beginning, we can't randomize people to smoke, and we can't, couldn't operationalize it if we could. So again, the outcome exposure relationships of our interest. But what makes this more difficult in terms of translating the results into conclusions is it's sometimes difficult to directly assess causality because of selection bias issues which may lead to systematic differences between the exposure groups on things other than the exposures of interest. So example, and we talked about some in the first section as well, but smokers might be more likely to drink alcohol, which may also affect their health as it relates to the outcome of interest. Or vegetarians might be healthier in terms of their exercise as well. So if we're looking at the relationship between some outcome and diet, some of the relationship we see might be because of the better exercise status of those who are vegetarian. So a classic example of an observational study and the questions it raises were in terms of a study looking at the impact of a drug called mendectin for nausea on women who are pregnant. And they were trying to see if it was associated with poor birth outcomes. And so the question they wanted to look at is, are children born to women who took mendectin for nausea more likely to have birth defects? Well, this was done as an observational study. They took a random sample of mothers who gave birth in the past year, and they compared those who had taken Mendectin, they compared the birth outcomes, users versus non-users. And they found a significant difference in the rate of birth defects between those who took the drug and who didn't. But on that first pass, it may be difficult to attribute that difference to the drug alone. This was an observational study. A significant difference could be explained by the following. It could be because mendectin causes birth defects. It could be not because of the mendectin itself, but others who took the mendectin also took other drugs, and maybe it's those other drugs that were related to birth defects. Or maybe mothers who took mendectin were different in other ways. Medical, maybe they were in worse health, or lower socioeconomic status, or maybe higher socioeconomic status, or other things that may be related to the outcome of interest. So the problem with observational studies is the potential obfuscation or magnification of associations because of other behind-the-scene factors, sometimes called confounders. Now, there are ways we can deal with these, and we'll talk about these in a little bit, but let's give a few more examples of such studies. And sometimes observational studies are done in situations where randomization could be done as an easier first pass to establish association and to demonstrate a potential association that could be followed up with a randomized study. And when there's been some classic examples where observational studies showed one thing and then the follow-up randomized showed something else, kind of, again, highlighting the difficulty of eliminating sort of these behind-the-scenes systematic differences between exposures and non-exposure groups when doing the analyses and making the conclusions. So one example you may have heard about was with beta carotene and cancer. There were several observational studies, and I'm pulling this from an article about a follow-up randomized study, and I'm just pulling this text directly, and you can see the attribution down there. So the abstract background says, observational studies suggest that people who consume more fruits and vegetables containing beta-carotene have somewhat lower risks of cancer and cardiovascular disease 
and earlier basic research suggested plausible biological mechanisms. Because, though, large randomized trials of long duration were necessary to test this hypothesis directly and remove any systematic imbalances or biases that may have been present, we conducted a trial of beta-carotene supplementation. And what these researchers found in their result, the randomized trial among healthy men, 12 years of supplementation with beta-carotene produced neither benefit nor harm in terms of the incidence of malignant neoplasms, cardiovascular disease, or death from all causes. So the randomized trial refuted the results from the prior observational studies and showed no association. And when all things are laid out in the table, even the best observational studies in which the analyses take into account systematic differences between the exposed and unexposed groups could miss something. However, we can't always follow up an observational study with a randomized study, of course, and sometimes observational study is the only type of study that can be performed. And luckily, we have statistical techniques to count for potential issues in selection bias. These can be addressed if the factors related to both the outcome and exposure, the things that systematically differ between the exposure groups and may be related to the outcomes, and these are sometimes called confounders. If we can account for them, if we know what these are, we measure them in advance, we can actually account for them in the analysis process. And that's something we'll focus on in Lecture 3 and beyond for the rest of the course. We can get what are called adjusted outcome exposure relationships, and we'll talk more about that in subsequent lectures. But the important thing is you can't adjust for these imbalances unless you know what they are, and anticipating them and measuring them is sometimes hard to do. So a classic example in which observational studies are used is in looking at the efficacy of needle exchange programs for intravenous drug users. And the idea is that if you give intravenous drug users clean needles in which to shoot their drugs, it may reduce the comorbidities associated with injection drug use because they won't be sharing infections. And certainly HIV is something associated with intravenous drug use and sharing needles. So there's been a plethora of studies mostly showing the efficacy. But it's a tricky thing to do. Certainly we cannot randomize subjects to clean needle exchange or not, because structurally, if somebody were to only use needles themselves that were clean, it would not be plausible for them to contract any other condition. So it's not ethical to randomize people to clean needle exchange or not. So we have to go with observational studies and look at those who self-elect to participate versus those who don't. So a study was done in Montreal that actually showed an increased risk of HIV infection for intravenous drug users who participated in the Montreal Needle Exchange Program compared to those who didn't. And it was actually a sizable increase, a tenfold increase, although there was a lot of uncertainty with it. The confidence interval went from 3.3 to over 30. But the point being that there seemed to be, and unfortunately seemed to be, a positive association between participation and the infection rate. The researchers were experienced in such study designs, and they actually accounted for things that may be differential between those who participated and those who didn't, including drug use since last visit, the number of times they used drug in a period of time, whether they borrowed IV equipment on top of participation in the exchange, the number of times the new equipment was used, et cetera, et cetera. They tried to account for all these things, and the results I gave you were post-accounting for those things. But the tricky thing is, there may be other things that they didn't account for, didn't think to measure, or couldn't measure on persons that may be related to HIV infection and also strongly related to participation in the needle exchange. Now, on the other side, the flip side, another study done in the same time period in New York City found the opposite result, that the relative risk of HIV infection for IV drug users by needle exchange participation was 30% that of those who didn't participate in the New York City program, and it was statistically significantly lower. And these researchers did the same thing, adjusted for other characteristics that may have been associated with IV drug use. The Bruno study, the original study done in Montreal, came with a caveat. It said it is possible that despite the exhaustive data-driven process to identify confounders, those systematic differences, some had been left unaccounted for. None of the studies reported was a randomized clinical trial 
so a causal link cannot be inferred. We cannot control for whatever factors led some subjects to use the syringe exchanges. This is the difficulty in observational studies. So we'll learn about how to adjust for potential systematic differences or confounders in subsequent portions of this course. The adjustment is not the problem. The more difficult thing is anticipating these things and measuring them. And unfortunately, in observational studies, there's always that nagging question of, did we get them all? Observational studies and natural experiments are also types of prospective cohort studies if the exposure of interest precedes the outcome in time. So in our examples, the blood transfusion preceded HIV. Seroconversion in hemophiliacs, or the use of the needle exchange, preceded HIV seroconversion. 